Hi, my name is Paige. I'm a junior at Wellesley and I'm part of the volunteer team for this year's Black Maternal Health Conference. I would like to welcome and thank you guys so much for coming. Um, so we're first gonna be hearing from Dr. Ndidimaka Umuta Unukaga. Uh, is she's an associate professor in the Department of Public Health and Community Medicine at Tufts University School of Medicine. Her current research interests include health disparities, reproductive health, maternal and infant mortality, and HIV and AIDS in Black women. Ndidi Maka is a member of the American Public Health Association and is currently the co-chair of the Perinatal and Women's Health Committee in the Maternal and Child Health section. Ndidi Maka is the principal investigator of two multi-year studies on maternal mortality and morbidity, an R01 funded by the NIH and an interdisciplinary grant funded by RWJ. Additionally, she's a member of the MA COVID-19 Maternal Equity Coalition and was honored at the APHA MCH Section's Young Professional of the Year Award in 2019. She's also in the 2020-2021 class of the top 40 under 40 minority leaders in healthcare, an annual award given out to National Minority Quality Forum. Finally, Dr. Muta Onukaga is the founder and director of the Maternal Outcomes for Translational Health Equity Research Lab, Mother Lab for short and is comprised of over 35 students from undergrad to postdoc with a keen interest in reducing the maternal health disparities as experienced by black women. Welcome to the fourth annual Black Maternal Health Conference. While I'm used to greeting you in a chatting, open, exciting room, I'm very proud to be hosting you today in a virtual format for our second year in a row for the Black Maternal Health Conference. I am hopeful that the virtual format of today's event will serve as an opportunity for even wider audience outreach and more accessible programming. With over 800 people registered and tuning in from over 20 states and countries, this is truly a one of a kind conference that I hope will leave us more knowledgeable, aware, and compassionate. Good morning, my name is Dr. Amuta Anukaga, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Public Health and Community Medicine here at Tufts University School of Medicine. I'm also assistant dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's my honor to be here with you all at the fourth annual Black Maternal Health Conference that I've been leading in Boston since 2017. I want to start off with a note of gratitude. Thank you to my mother lab and my March team with a special shout out to Dr. Bathsheba Wariso, who has spearheaded this conference, along with her trusty team of volunteers, including Beverly Widebe, Paige Fayok, Kelechi Ofor, many others, Naja Walton, thank you so much, Mamie, Ebu, thank you all. Um, and for months of hard work, Jennifer Akinduro, thank you, um, in preparation and making this conference a reality. So the Mother Lab that I started stands for the Maternal Outcomes for Translational Health Equity Research. It's a, it's a 35 student interdisciplinary research lab focused on addressing maternal health disparities in black women. We also have an undergraduate club called MARCH, which is the Maternal Advocacy and Research for Community Health and the Maternal Child Health Journal Club. So I serve as the advisor for March. I'm the founder and director of the Mother Lab, and I'm the faculty advisor for the Maternal and Child Health Journal Club. All three of these gems, these beautiful places for students to meet, discuss, plan, strategize, and advocate for Black women and maternal health disparities really came out of the pandemic and us being in a virtual format from COVID-19. All of these spaces allow us to ask the questions we have fought to bring attention to for decades and for allowing us to be able to do the work that will incite radical transformation in the field of maternal health, health disparities, and reproductive justice. In all three of these spaces, Mother Lab, March, and the Journal Club, we have been centering the work of doulas as mechanisms, conduits for social, political, and clinical change. Doulas have been underrepresented and silenced for far too long in the world, especially in the United States. Doula care is a practice that was taken away from Black Indigenous people of color 
individuals and community. And ironically, it's being rediscovered now as research is telling us what ancestors already knew. That the silencing of these voices cannot be under, underestimated. The silencing of doula voices is rooted in racism and it dates back to slavery in the United States. It follows the abuse and experimentation on black bodies, black enslaved women bodies, as well as the medicalization of the birthing process. And I have to lift up the names of Betsy, Lucy, and Anarka in this space. These were three black women that paved with sacrifice of their bodies, of their consent, no anesthesia, paved the way for us to be able to enjoy a lot of the technology and the gynecological advances that we see in medical medicine and OBGYN care today. So thinking back now about the discrimination against granny midwives in the South held by racist policies, such as the Shepherd Towner Act, to how even in modern day times, doulas are not always allowed in the delivery room of hospitals, there's no denying that doulas have been deprived of the space, respect, autonomy, prioritization, reimbursement that they deserve. The truth is this is not rocket science. Quite frankly, nothing in healthcare should ever be. This is about choosing to listen and then acting on what is heard. Today, at the fourth annual Black Maternal Health Conference, we will be doing a lot of listening to doulas and other maternal health advocates and experts in the field. We will be hearing from revolutionary speakers and professionals, including Chanel Portia Albert, Dr. Monica McLemore, Quetia Osorio, Dr. Nikitra Burse, Mama Shafia Monroe, Jenny Joseph, Fatima Danke, Marlene Boyette, and Dr. Audra Meadows. With this exciting and inspirational lineup, as well as the presence and attention all of you are bringing here today, I am incredibly honored and excited for the official start of the conference. Thank you all for being here today. And without further ado, welcome to the fourth annual Black Maternal Health Conference. Hi, so I'm now gonna be introducing our keynote speaker for today, Mama Shafia. Shafia Monroe is a renowned midwife, doula trainer, master of public health, speaker, and writer. Monroe spent over three decades studying the life of 19th and 20th century African-American midwife and has traveled internationally interviewing and shadowing midwives to learn their cultural rituals. In 1991, she founded the International Center for Childbearing, the first national non-for-profit to increase midwives and doulas of color, honor black midwives' contributions, and empower families to improve birth outcomes. Under her leadership, the ICTC organized a coalition for Oregon to investigate the use of doulas to improve birth outcomes, creating the legislative concept HB 33111, which resulted in the Medicaid reimbursement for Oregon doulas. In 2013, Shafia Monroe Consulting and Birthing Change formed to help healthcare providers and doulas achieve cultural competency, increase clients, and improve birthing outcomes. Her work has been recognized by numerous awards, including the Dr. Hildress A. Poindexter Lifetime Achievement Award of the Black Caucus of Healthcare Workers, the oldest caucus of the American Public Health Association, and the Maternal Child Health Lifetime Achievement Award and the Lifetime Achievement Service Award for Community Health. And I'm turning it over to Mama Shafia to share her screen. Good morning, everyone. I'm so ecstatic to be here. Thank you, Dr. Ndidi, that's what I call her, uh, to be here with you all. So I'm in Portland, Oregon, so it is a wonderful early 9.05 a.m. And my goal is to help us realize the importance of empowering doulas as a way not just to improve maternal health, but in true, to improve Black family health in general. So my story, I am from Boston, Massachusetts in 1976. I began learning about infant mortality, black infant mortality, Roxbury, Massachusetts at that time, predominantly black community. And so I realized that the black babies were dying and didn't know why I was a, a young person at that time under uh, 21. But as I'm reading my work, I'm realizing that there's these 
amazing women. I call them the uh, this the their profile is stellar to me, and they are the 20th century, rather the 19th century African American midwives, and they were doing work that we that I teach today, such as reminding us that we have black birth traditions and we have postpartum rituals that really kept black women, black people, black families and black fathers, the whole community healthy. Cause we understand that in order to have a healthy baby and to have a healthy mother or a healthy birthing person, we need to have rituals that we know work. And those rituals as Dr. Ndidi just mentioned were eradicated when they took the black midwife out of the black community during the 1920s and 1950s. So we're forced from having home births with women who understood the culture. In fact, a lot of the uh, research says that the African-American midwife of the South, actually her role was to continue teaching black birth traditions to the mothers, as well as duplication, as well as parenting. And so when we lost her, we moved to a white institution that was racism and we were ashamed to practice our culture, we slowly began to lose those, those, uh, those traits. So my goal for the last 30 something years has been to research the granny midwives and to elevate their work through a doula training. But before I go any further, as I talk about traditions, I do want to do a libation. And so this is a tradition where we call in the ancestors Nan Kuleka Tayemba just passed away, one of our grand midwives from uh, Halberd Action Center. A full Hassan, I get emotional, but they're very close to me. A full Hassan just passed the other day. She ran the birthing place in Houston, Texas. You can see her Instagram teaching all the time. The same with um, Ayana Ade. So I call out Nan Kuleko to be with us today. She be proud, Ashe. A full Hassan, Ayana Ade. Ms. Margaret Charles Smith, I call him Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, and all those black women leaders who were in the forefront of what I do today. So thank you, I thank them. So I have seven children and I had midwives for all of my children, except for the first one at home birth, all were born at home. Uh, the first one, I could not find a black midwife in uh, in Boston, which is why I wanted to become a midwife. I could not find a midwife, though there were midwives in Boston at the time. So I went having a, a male uh, Jewish doctor help, which I appreciate Dr. Eli for me having that experience. So I have my children and we spend a lot of time in Boston teaching black women the history of black midwifery from historical context, but also encouraging black women to have their babies at home as a form of self-determination. So we know now we have an increase of black wanting home birth because of COVID. Before COVID, we wanted home birth in the 70s and 80s because what we see today, we saw then, which was black women, black people not being respected in hospital settings, not being respected in the clinical settings. And I'm gonna say black fathers because for me, it's important that we keep the black father in the conversation. And so I respect partners and all others, but I want the black man who's being killed uh, at, a very, at the highest rate, as we know, I want to make sure that we that we included him. And that's one thing the Black midwife did in the South. She did uh, use male and female energy. She included both energies, both sexes for the work. It wasn't a feminist movement. She was never just for women only. She was always family and center. And that's why it's so important that we empower our doulas in teaching the same thing. It's not just about the mother as we know. It is about the family. It is about living through childbirth and being to raise a child and having the significant other, the father or the partner, and even the children know what to do. So the black midwife at that time, she was a pillar in her community. She was one you went to, not just around birth, but menopause, marital problems, you know, teenage acting up, whatever you want to think. And I remember uh, walking down the street one day in Boston, I like to talk to elder people before I became an elder. And I asked one of the old women, like, what do you remember about your midwife? And she was from Georgia. She said, after school, I would always go to her house and visit and we would talk. And also she pierced my ears. So in my in the doula training that I do, we actually teach the doulas how to pierce ears if they want to. Another tradition that we used to do, we didn't bring our babies to the Walmart to have some stranger put a punch a hole through our baby's ear. It was done by 
a loving family member of our community, either the midwife or auntie. So that's just uh, something that we want to include uh, when we talk about empowering uh, doulas. So I then moved to Oregon, 1991. I had heard a little bit about doulas, but I didn't pay a lot of attention because my goal was really to really elevate the black midwife and increase the number of black midwives in, in Boston. So we trained a lot of doulas in Boston. But when I went to uh, Portland, Oregon in 1991, I had to stop training midwives for various reasons and started the International Center for Traditional Childbearing. And that's the first African-American or black institution nationally that again, elevated midwifery. But then we did in, in uh, 2002, we picked up training doulas. And so when I heard about, you know, Dana Raphael, who's the white American anthropologist who discovered the term doula and learned that it meant slave woman or servant woman, and then further learned that it had been going on since 1969. So when people say, well, why aren't black women involved with being, you know, doulas? Well, we weren't involved because one, we didn't need it. We had the term labor coach in our black community. So you had a labor coach would go with you to the hospital and actually did the similar things that we call what a doula does today. But even more importantly, during that time, as we talk about black midwives in history, it was our mothers who took care of us. And that's, we have the big gap. I am, I am gonna talk about empowering doulas, but we have to also understand why are we in this situation in the first place? Again, they took our black midwives out of our community. They shamed us for breastfeeding and a lot of things that we did having our baby squatting, you know, eating watermelon, all these things became shameful in our culture. And so, Little by little, along with the twilight sleep, where we have black women and all women in America being put to sleep and unconscious from the 50s to almost the late 70s, uh, women woke up not knowing what happened to them, plus they dried their milk up. So mothers lost the ability to help their daughters. They did not know what to do because it was not done for them. So we have this big gap where historically, if you were black, I remember um, 1976, I had my first baby at home and my mother died when I was young, so I didn't have my mom, but all my friends were saying, who were pregnant were saying, I'm going home to have my baby. I'm going home, I'm going home, I'm going home. Or every now and then their mother would come up. And so that was a tradition, which by the way, is a West African tradition and probably all of Africa. You go back to your source, your mother, because she's gonna take care of you. She's gonna cook for you. She's gonna wrap your stomach. She's gonna help your breasts, you know, leak the milk out correctly. She's gonna massage you. She's gonna you know, take care of the other children, support your partner supporting you. She's gonna steam you, you know, all the things that we teach. Our mothers did know how to do that. So I do have seven children. I do have four daughters. Of course, uh, one daughter did have children and my son's uh, wives had children. So of course they didn't need a doula because I was that person. I moved in, I wrapped it. I did everything that we want to bring back that tradition. So when we talk about empowering doulas, Doulas are going to be empowered so they can also empower the families. Because there's no way that we can have enough doulas to take care of every single Black family. We have to bring the knowledge back to the community so we all know what to do. And then the doula is empowered as the expert because she understands the medical terminology more. She understands the process of birth, you know, centimeters, dilation, you know, occipital posterior, you know, squatting. She has that training. She can be that bridge between the medical system and the family. But then we want the family to pick up because really traditionally what the uh, black midwife did was so important as we talk about maternal mortality, she visited the mother very frequently and the mother had a ritual having to stay in the bed for nine days and then she would come back to take the mother out the bed. But in the meantime, the mother was there doing those things. So when we talk about you know the doula being enslaved woman and Dana Raphael discovering that, that that person as she traveled around the world because she had a poor breastfeeding outcome for her first baby in the early 50s. So she started traveling as an anthropologist to find out what were people doing to have good breastfeeding experiences. And she saw that when a woman had a baby, there was always another woman in the womb that was supporting her, usually the mother or a grandmother. So that's how that term came to the country. So I wanna say with that terminology that black women you know, we are the first doula in America. We're gonna talk about enslaved. Well, we came as enslaved, and for sure, we took care of white women on the plantation. Uh, they would go into labor. 
not in labor, we took them during their pregnancy. So we're cooking for them. You know, they get nausea, we're, we're cleaning up the throw up, we're bringing them food back and forth. We, we had to massage them. We had to change their bed. So we definitely had to wait on them by force. Later when they go into labor, whether it was a white doctor coming to deliver their baby, because a lot of them wanted white doctors only, they didn't want black midwives, and some did want black midwives, depending on what era you, you were in. But for sure, they wanted a black woman at their birth. Every white woman in the South believed that to have a good experience, you had to have a black woman with you because we knew how to take care of them because we knew how to take care of ourselves because we knew our culture from Africa. So the black midwives definitely carried on the tradition in America and taught to their daughters. We practiced it on the plantation uh, in the so-called enslaved quarters. We brought that same skill set to them. So we were already doulas. So we didn't, I, I didn't jump on that word right away. But in 2002, I decided it was time to create a doula program for black women centered on blackness, culture, pride, and ownership of this. You know, and after enslavement, we continued to be in the word doula, but the word was called domestics because we could only take care of white families to make a living. We weren't allowed to really have jobs, either sharecropping or you had to work for a white family. And of course, they were having children. And so pretty much we have a history of caring for uh, white women as do as well as ourselves. I just want to share that. And so I want to uh, go to the next slide, please. And well, Shafia, um, you're, you're controlling your slides, so just click and it should go to the next one. Oh. Ooh, it's not. Use your cursor to click on the screen. And there should be arrows at the bottom. Yeah, right there. Okay, thank you all. So what does empowerment mean? It, it means that we want to give doulas the authority or power to do something. And that is, first of all, to be Kuki Chagalia, Swahili for self-determination, to determine their own destiny as black doulas, I'm speaking of in particular, and to name ourselves and define ourselves. So as black people, a lot of us don't like the word doula because it means enslaved, enslaved woman or they're trying to stop into to, um, servant woman. There's a lot of different organizations that have that are black that are saying, you know, sister, birth sister, a sister friend, we're full circle doula, birth companion, the birth companion. And so we don't want the pressure of the outside tells us how to function as doula. So we want that authority and part of what works for our community, first of all, not to have to apologize. We want to center our blackness and our culture in the work that we do. Uh, we're giving ourselves permission to save our community. We don't have to ask. And I don't know if you all know my rep, but I've never asked. I always do what has to be done because that's what I have to do. That's why I mentioned uh, Harry Tubman. She didn't ask to be free and go back and get our entire family. So during the truth and the, and the many other leaders that we have who've gone on before us. We need to remember what they did and how strong they were and determine. Uh, we're giving power to ourselves as doulas. Um, and, we're, and we're giving our thumbs up to ourselves. And we're going to become confident in doing things. And we're going to claim our rights to practice again in our communities in a way that works for our community. And we don't have to apologize and movements to, to empower the poor, but even to empower our rich Black women. You know, every Black person is not poor. As I spoke yesterday to Congress uh, Underwood, mentioning that Medicaid is great, and I'm for the uh, Mominous Bill 2021, but everybody's not on Medicaid. When we look at the maternal mortality rate and the infant mortality rate, we think of young teens and people who are getting public assistance, but the studies show, in fact, it's really professional women who are having the problems. We have to break that, that public health, and I have my master in public, I understand, but we have to break that public health concept that it's only people who are considered low income. This is a black issue regardless of our education, marital status, sexual preference, uh, you, you name it. And so we want to empower the black community and that's what the black do is gonna do um, is the goal. So, and, and just cause also I didn't mention along with being a midwife for 40 years, I'm also a doula trainer. I've trained over, I'm gonna say 5,000, but I'll say four, close for sure, 4,000 women uh, in some men and transgender since 2002. We created the first black doula training organization and company and curriculum in the nation. So we have done a lot of um, 
development to make sure that we include cultural competency within our training. Because I want to look at the words that we use. So we say disparity and inequity. So I chose the word for the title, empowering doers to address inequities and not disparities, because it's important to understand that disparity is just a sense of difference or lack of, but inequity means that it's unfair. It's a state of being unfair. It's unfair that Black people cannot have children without the mother or the birthing person having to die. It's not fair that our fathers, sons, and daughters go out the door and get shot and choked. It's not fair that they go to school with no school books and only mail attack. A lot of things are not fair. So there's inequities going on. So as doulas, the first thing we want to do is understand the terminology and make sure that we're using it correctly. Another term is BIPOC. So BIPOC is, I don't know where it came from, but I think we need to get rid of it. Um, I, we're Black people. We cannot just get watered into some acronym. You know, why can't we just be who we are? We're Black people, African descent. You know, say the name. We don't have to always do a shortcut. So BIPOC and disparities, reconsider those terminologies when you express what you're trying to do for empowerment. We want power and we want truth. The truth is that this is an equity. This is a by design. We have all the research to say what's going on in this country, and we're still talking about some things we're talking about. So I want to put that out there as well. I don't want to talk a lot about material mortality and morbidity, but to understand that mortality means death of 100,000 people gave birth, and morbidity is the, is the sickness. So we talk about maternal mortality because, of course, death is the ultimate situation or experience that a family is going to have when they lose a loved one who they thought, you know, was going to come home with a new baby. And we know that babes or their mothers have a harder time, no disrespect to fathers or partners, but they have a harder time often. So we don't want death. We also have to understand, too, that we need to mention the word morbidity a lot more because there's so many Black women who are suffering from being ill from having a baby. They didn't die. They almost died. And if they, and if they didn't die, they have this cesarean section trauma. Not so much that it was a bad thing, because it's not always bad, but the healing and the expectation of the community where the doula is going to come in and let people know that this mother or this person had major surgery. She had a baby and she had surgery, so she can't jump right back up and do things that a vaginal birth person um, could do. And so we do need to know as we, you know, the first thing I want to say to empower ourselves as Jula is to have evidence-based information, to know um, Black culture, to know what infant, mature, what infant mortality means, to know what maternal mortality means, to understand what it takes to prevent premature births, and uh, what it takes to help mothers and pregnant people have preconceptional help. And so we say, we need a full circle scope. We need trainings that are covering that. So the traditional training that was created in the 70s was just about being with the woman and helping her during labor. For the black community, as you all are already doing, I know there's so many uh, different trainings out there, community-based, property-based, where there's much, much more being taught about what needs to happen. We're going to have a better outcome in our communities. And at the same time, you all, as I always say publicly, we can do all the good things. We can eat right, preconceptionally, have the right, you know, stash with our partner. Everything's perfect. We still see through educated women, educated people, and, and six income figure people are still having poor outcomes. So racism is still there. And so we don't ever want to let the system off the hook. You know, as, as empowering ourselves as jewelers, is letting people know that we're doing all this, but still we need you, America, to fix yourself because you're causing the problem. You know, we're victims, we're not, we're not at risk, we're at risk of spracing, we're at risk of you not treating us right. We're not genetically in, uh, inferior, there's nothing wrong with us. We're not dying with something wrong with us. We're dying because the situation that's been put upon us makes us more prone, but also we're dying because when we tell you that we don't feel right, we have a headache, we have spots in front of our eyes, my back hurts, you know, my baby's not, um, doesn't look right, it's not feeding correct, you ignore us. It's not that important to you. We have all these myths that, you know, we can tolerate pain, you know, we don't hurt, we don't really grieve, we don't really care about our children, you know, we're hypochondriacs, you know, we're trying to get drugs. All these myths go into the white medical system. So as black doulas, we have a very big job. And I want to thank you all right off the bat by saying, as Billy Avery said to the black midwives, you have a special crown, you have a special star in your crown. 
And everybody cannot do what you can do. And everyone not, has not been called to do what you do. And just like the black granny midwife who was called by the creator, she says, if you read her stories, had dreams, was told by another person, you should do this work. As I meet all the 4,000 doulas I've talked to, I've read for years since 2002, 18 years of their introduction of why they want to get into work from personal stories to since they were little, they wanted to work with babies. Uh, they want to help their community, the community, the tie the inequities. There's so many different reasons why we do the work. But the fact that you all do it is what counts. So where are our mothers not making it? Where is it happening? So it's happened across the entire spectrum. I'm going to try to get a, um, a little point. Uh-oh. Well, I may not get it. Okay, so maternal mortality is happening from the time the person gets pregnant until up to one year after the baby's born, 365 days. The first uh, part we wanna look at is the day of delivery from one to six days. So this is a time, it's about empowerment. As I talk about full circle, uh, scope of doula care, we have to go beyond just uh, seeing the mother at, you know, one time prenatally and then going to the hospital when she's seven centimeters, whatever time people go, people go different times, there's different policies, what they want to do, and maybe making a visit, you know, somewhere, hoping the first week. But instead, we have to find out how we can fund our doulas to really practice the legacy of the 19th century African American midwife. And the reason why our doula training, and I use that, that philosophy for a foundation for holistic doula training because this person went to that woman's house frequently to check on her and to check on the entire family. And so we're hearing so many mothers in the first six days don't know who to talk to, they're bleeding too heavy, they're having serious um, postpartum cramps, involution, you know, their breasts have gotten engorged, the baby's crying, the little four-year-old is running around the house and maybe the partner has to go to work. They, we need a system where doulas can go in for those first six days to identify what if there's a problem. Now we know from mainstream, I'm gonna call it mainstream doula trainings that we don't do uh, clinical care, and we don't give medical advice. That's true. At the same time, we teach from a public health platform, which means that we need our doulas to know more than just being with something on a birth ball and using a birth bar. That was a great, and we need more than this physiological birth. That's not what we need as a black community. We need holistic full scope birth, full circle birth and, and skills where you're, you're learning. This is gonna take time if you don't already know, but you have to, have to take more continued ed education where we're learning that when someone says, you know, I'm bleeding and the size of, of a golf ball is coming out. Well, they need to call their doctor. In fact, you I say, just go in. Sometimes just go in because all the talk over the phone doesn't always help. You can't always diagnose um, Things. So many things have been misdiagnosed trying to talk to somebody over the phone because the person really can't describe what's going on. So basic things, uh, going and wrapping your mother's stomach, you know, making sure that she's in a clean bed, that she's had a shower, and definitely, definitely, definitely hands-on. Again, many doula trainings are taught you don't touch the mother. That is not the African way. The gritty midwives, if you read, they had goose grease, uh, you know, we had shea butter, we have uh, Castor oil had all kind of oil because you know we all like our skin all shiny as we say the old term dry skin ashy skin whatever you want to call it we rub our moms we rub our pregnant parent you know I knew we we rub them while they're pregnant you're pushing energy into them you put good energy into them with, with good touch their back is hurting we know that when you're pregnant the, the first thing that goes you know that that lower back they need a back rub they need physical contact and the same after the baby's born. And having done the work as a doula and as a midwife, because I practice the same. If I, you know, when I go, I, you know, for me, for the granny midwife, she caught the baby. But the other part was all what we call doula work, cooking for people, cleaning their house, running their, uh, their postpartum herbal bath, getting them ready for the steam on the little stool, you know, rubbing them after the, after their, after they had their shower, you know, holding the baby while they lay and, and eat and drink their soup or separate drink their soup, you know, ask them how they're doing. This is all the other part that we need around improving maternal health. And as you all may know who've done this, the mothers always say, oh my God, I feel so different. The pregnant, I feel so different. Thanks for coming. I just needed to see you because you have 
the professionals. And yes, they love their mom, and maybe the mom does have a relationship. But often, they want this professional person, the professional jewel, to come in and give that. So from from one to six, we want to find a way to make sure that we are visiting. And then from seven to forty-two days, to be honest, um, unless their mother lives there or some other person. The other thing about we want to look about too the history of the black midwife and black womanhood and, and, and femaleness was that we work in groups. I know that we're separated now, it's a lot difficult, but a doula having the, the concept that she can never leave the mother, uh, even in the hospital, not even how to go to the bathroom where doulas wind up being burnt out, but to re-empower herself. We can redesign how we determine what a doula is. And for my uh, philosophy is that you want to have two or three people and it's like, a, and you want to let the family know that, you know, it's going to be me, Aisha, and, and Deborah. We know we're, we're all systems. We're going to, you know, systems sons of birth systems. We're going to work with you collectively. And maybe I might step out to check on my children. I need to get something to eat so I can stay strong and not get burned out. And Aisha's going to step in. And you love Aisha as much as you love me. And she loves you too. And so when you make these home visits, let's get some rotation going. It doesn't have to be one person. That, that's the American way of just very nuclear just one, as opposed to the African way of village and a more collective. We all know that when it's Thanksgiving time, whatever holiday y'all got, and you're cooking, everyone's in the kitchen helping out, no one's exhausted. And they're having seven kids and trying to cook, but I ain't cooking with myself. Y'all get up in here and help me because this is more than a one woman job. I'm not gonna get burnt out. So the same with the dual work. So seven to 42 days. Uh, during pregnancy, we need to really be empowered to understand what is the importance of prenatal care, uh, and also, I'm going to say later, uh, next slide, but I'm going to tell you right now that we need to align our clients with midwives. We need more midwives, you all. We can be good doers, but it's the midwife who's reducing infant mortality by the type of care she gives, women-centered care, the, uh, the midwifery model of care, and we need more Black midwives. And one thing I love to see is that so many doulas get this inspiration after several years and they go on to become midwives. So we have a shortage of midwives of all races, but definitely a severe shortage of black midwives. We need to be able to have a black midwife talk to our client in a loving way, respectful, understand them. We know from the recent study is that when the newborns who were ill, by having a, back, a black pediatrician, they had a higher rate of survival. And I love my black OBs and nothing against you all, but we need to have women who are considered low risk to have midwives, we, we want women and pregnant people to understand they have the option of having a midwife and it should be the first one I defend, should be midwifery care. So as doulas, I want us to empower ourselves to, to work to understand where are the midwives in our community, get to know them and make sure that your client knows they have the right to switch. Even at nine months, they can switch to a midwife. So they have less maternal morbidity, less maternal mortality, less cesarean section. Uh, women have more voice, the person has more voice about their birth. So during the pregnancy, we want to uh, reduce that loss by referring our clients to good prenatal care, seeing uh, a midwife. Thomas Shafia, thank, yes. you, thank you so much. I wanna make sure that we give some time uh, to answer these phenomenal questions that are coming through in the chat. I'll go quickly. Um, all righty, sounds good. Okay, so here's some numbers. This shows, um, you know, Black, American, I'm gonna move this thing so I can see it, Native American, but the whole point is that this is the black race. So it went up, up the highest, second is Native American, Alaskan, and it went down a little bit. You know, right now they're doing a lot of check the boxes, so they're changing the numbers around, they're saying that it's not as high as they thought it was, but it doesn't matter if it's gone down a few or not. The point is that, no, it's not moving again. The point is, is that, um, Thank you all. The point is, is that it's still too high. So this just shows again, just the Hispanic being lower than white and Asian Pacific Islander, American Indian. So I just want to say, we say Hispanic, you got to say Afro Hispanic and white Hispanic. There's racism in the Latina community. I've been to Af the Colombia with the Afro Colombia and Puerto Rico. Uh, many times they give their stories and so we have to break that number down too. Because that's, that's, there's a, if you break between black, Hispanic and white, you're gonna see something very similar, unfortunately. And I'm trying to get there, you all. Okay, 
the leading cause of for black people is uh, preeclampsia. So that's why I promote doulas learning how to do blood pressures. I know we're giving clients their own uh, cuffs right now, but it's still a good skill to know and most uh, medical providers will tell you that the cuff is the most accurate. So even though they say we don't do blood pressures, all of our, all of my, the Joes that we've trained all take blood pressure since 2002. They don't have to do it, but we want them to know how to do it. Not to diagnose, but to say, hey, as a doula who's empowered, you should know that a blood pressure of the lowest number being 90 and the highest being 140 or 130, she needs to call the provider right away and go in. That could be the beginning of preeclampsia. And don't let them say, oh, black people have high blood pressures anyways. And because 60% of mature deaths could be avoided if we got rid of that attitude. Uh, you all know the benefits that we increase spontaneous vaginal births. That's why we want to empower doulas. We want we have shorter labor, a less cesarean section. People feel better about their birth experience, less forceps and vacuum extractors, less regional anaglycias, uh, better uh, APGAR score, and reduced intervention during labor. So those are some of the basics. But we also want to remember that we do things like create family values, uh, promote breastfeeding, uh, help families learn how to advocate for themselves. Also, some things to think about when you go in, that you're a team player. You don't, you know, you, you want to be part of the team, but we have to keep our autonomy. That's why, to a certain extent, doulas who are hired by the hospital are, are I'm trying to say this in a way, um, are good. But as we're learning, they're not connected to community often. They just see the mother right away. They meet her right where she's at. There's no before experience. There's no after experience. And also sometimes things that we don't agree with because we're being employed by them, you can't say that much, which is why I'm really about doulas being private entrepreneurs and able to bill for Medicaid or any insurance on their own. So, but go in, you know, non-adversary, you know, introduce yourself, you have a name tag, bring it. If you have a certificate, have that in your bag, introduce yourself to the head nurse when you come in, say who you are, uh, introduce yourself to the, 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 the nurse and the midwife or the MD. Also put your name up on the board there's a boy that has a doctor's name, the nurse add your name and say doula. All the time they want to assume that, you know, you're a family friend, and maybe you are, but you're still a professional doula. Uh, I statement, I'm concerned. Know that the, the client has the power. We are guests, we're not the paying customer, we're not the health consumer. So let your client know that you can only advocate as much as she advocates. And you want to get some code words um, in there. Uh, I learned this from my dear friend, Majita Amadi, who's a nurse um, in Alabama. If there's a problem, she said the doula on behalf of the mother should call the main number. You know, in the labor room, call the main number, ask the operator for the attending for the labor and delivery floor. Request they page him and request his attendance presence immediately in the hospital. That's the person who can oversee anybody else who's serving you. The attending is over the chief over the uh, residents, over the intern, for sure, over the medical provider. And the nurses, we know, uh, follow doctor's direction. So you want to learn to use that tactic if there's a problem. You don't have to wait and file a complaint after the damage is done. You can say, right, hey, I want the attending physician, call the main member and request. Uh, the mother can talk or the pregnant parent and labor person can talk. If not, you do it yourself on their behalf. Um, this just shows where midwives are. So Sweden, they're... Um, are uh, 12 OBs and 66 midwives. Australia, seven OBs per 1,000, 68 midwives. I'm gonna jump down to US, 11 OBs per 1,000. We're losing our OBs and we do need them. Everybody cannot have a home birth. Everybody cannot have only a midwife care. They're gonna need some high tech care. So we do want black OBs for sure. And culturally sensitive and culturally competent OBs of any race. But we only have four midwives per 1,000, and so that is not a good thing. Uh, this is a chart that talks about, we do birth plans. Birth plans, by the way, are effective. They did a study that when a client does a birth plan, it's, it's listened to and they have a better outcome. So as doulas, hopefully you all have been uh, aware how to do a birth plan. You can help your client do it. You can look at it. You don't want to make it too long. But we want to go beyond the birth plan and create the maternity care birth plan. So this is what we came up with, the MCB, because the birth plan is about really just the labor. And we're talking about improved maternal health and being empowered to do that. So, so our maternal care birth plan has to include the pregnancy, the birth, 
the labor and the postpartum um, care. So I'm not gonna hold on, I know we have to move, but looking for heavy bleeding, a placenta come out on its own for labor, have the mother stay mobile, she should be in an upright position. We still wanna encourage childhood education classes. A lot of folks still don't know where babies come from, just like they don't know about their period, so we still need education. As a doula to empower yourself, we should be looking at what is preeclampsia, know the signs and symptoms, uh, find resource for it, because it is one of the major reasons why African or Black women are experiencing um, problems with their maternal health. And then some actions that you want to continue on. So even though you took your training, we have continued education. We all should take it. I'm glad that there's so many people on this on this conference coming to conferences, taking other trainings. Um, go take a class in school, but we need to understand what is informed consent so we can advocate for our client. We need to promote midwifery, understand patients' rights. Where are they? Have you gone over them with your client? Do you know them? Hands-on, touch our mothers, uh, the laboring person. Uh, we need comparable skills. All that we're talking about is very uh, in intense work. So do we need to have a serious living wage so we won't get burned up. We won't quit and get a second job. And so we need to continue to look for ways to pay doulas. We should be certified. A lot of people take the training, they don't finish. Now with the Medicaid reimbursement that's going national, we hear across the uh, nation that a lot of things are coming into place where they're gonna make us become certified. And I know this conversation, don't be certified. Um, and, 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 and I'm sorry, don't, because they're afraid that we're gonna go through what the black midwives went through being certified and then being Ill illegalized. But we do need proof that you finished your training if you're gonna look at getting um, insurances, particularly Medicaid is looking for a certification, but also it just lets people know that you really finished what you set out to do and you're good at it. Advocate, and then we want the medical system where it says uh, not to separate. We, you know, As we do all this good stuff to empower ourselves, we still need the medical system to be with us. We don't wanna go into a hospital where they're trying to always separate the client from the doula, so we need the medical system understand the value of doulas, to be courteous to doulas on the, on the floor, to make sure they understand that cesarean section, uh, getting an epidural, whatever it is, don't ask for a doula to leave. The client can ask, but not the medical team. Okay, thank you all. I went through, I had 30 minutes. I have so much to say, um, and I did the best I could in 30 minutes. So if you wanna reach me later, feel free. So I think we have some questions and answers time. And thank you all again. And thank you, uh, Tufts University and the whole conference team. Yeah, thank you, Mama Shafia. We really appreciate um, your talk on the historical as well as the modern day practices of the doula and all that we can do um, in our practices. We have about two minutes, um, so I don't believe we'll be able to get through any questions, but we did take down all the questions that everyone has put in the chat. Um, and so we'll make sure that um, all of those questions get answered in the community board under the topic uh, Q&A for Mama Shafia Monroe's keynote. Um, and I just wanna make sure that everyone knows we do have two sessions coming up. Um, firstly, we will be looking at um, Chanel Portia Albert, and these are beginning at 1 p.m., as well as uh, Dr. Audra Meadows. So again, these are both at 1 p.m. and the Zoom links will be posted in the chat very briefly. And thank you again, Mama Shafia. We really thank appreciate you. that thank beautiful you. talk. Have a wonderful day, you all. Blessings. Thank you.